Hi everyone, I'm Peter Hicks, I'm Director at Open Train Times, um, and it was this morning I thought how long I've been working for myself, and that's a year and a half now, so the pandemic has been going on far too long, I thought this would be a, a short laugh, but it's been going on a bit, but, um, so I'm going to present, or Sophie's going to present some of the work that um, RTX and Open Train Times have been doing um, on maintenance for trains. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. How much it is actually to be in a room? It's snacks. Those of us on line, sorry, you don't have snacks necessarily. Um, so, yes, I'm head of customer success at IOTIX. Um, IOTIX is a small company um, based um, originally out of Cambridge, or of course, we're somewhat dispersed at the moment, um, that um, became a, a, a company in its own right 2014. Um, we have a capability that allows data from anything to interact with data from any other thing. So be that a database, a device, a sensor. It is a generic capability. Um, and therefore we've been working in a multitude of different sectors. But the, one of those that has really sort of stuck with us is, is rail. So we'd like to talk to you about a use case that we, we started working on with Rolls-Royce Power Systems back in 2018 um, and has really started to take on a life of itself um, and hence the reason for bringing Peter in um, last year, around about, yes, just in the pandemic stage. Right, are we launching into presentation? Okay. Go to the next slide, please, Peter. So, um, as I said, we started out working with Rolls-Royce Power Systems. Um, originally, they requested that we looked at creating a digital twin, a digital twin of a power generating unit. Um, and the reason that they were interested in working with IOTIX was because they were interested in a data twin. So they'd already got partners working on visualization and analytics, and their interest really was in bringing data together around a particular asset. So we started to um, work with them and then, and then expand that use case out into the ecosystem. And the first real use for that we found was in maintenance. So hence the start of our journey really has been looking at how can we improve maintenance planning? So not necessarily maintenance in itself, but the planning of maintenance um, and also the planning of, of fleet balancing. So where we'd like to grow this, given that we're enabling things to talk to things, so components of trains to talk to trains, to talk to depots, etc. What we're really interested in doing now is seeing how can we grow this? Can we start to bring in infrastructure assets? And can we start to really present data to the rest of the community in a way that can be much more easily consumed and can fuel more data-driven services? Next slide, please. Yes, we all know what a complex ecosystem rail can be. Um, and um, as I said, we were looking originally at an asset and we've expanded out into the supply chain. So by looking at granular assets and building data around assets of interest, be that a component or be that a train or be that a, a set of signals or whatever it might be, um, you can start to look at those conversations. And each one of those individual items will have its own supply chain wrapped around it but there is always interest in how those components start to work together and those different assets work together. So massive ecosystem, we started with just this really small piece, which was the maintenance operations. Next slide, please. And the challenge presented to us was that of the, the depot manager. So you've got numerous trains coming in tonight for your shift. How do you understand how to prioritize what gets done? That should be straightforward enough. There are plenty of systems out there that should be showing the, uh, the depot managers which trains are actually arriving when. And certainly there are plenty of systems that are telling them what, what the issues are with, with each different train. What we discovered was that they did need help because there are instances when 
Stuff happens on the railway, as we all know. Cow hits train, cow hit cow and train met, I think on 18 occasions, just the, in the few times that we visited um, Swindon. So there's an awful lot of instances where you've got your day planned out, you think, no, something happens. The guys at Swindon have to switch trains around on a moment's notice. They don't necessarily have time to update the digital systems. They may be scribbling things down on paper and catching up afterwards. That means that the people at the depot are always the last to know, always the last to know what's happened when. So that means trains will be coming in early. They'll be coming in late. They won't be arriving at all. They'll be arriving somewhere else. And the, the and I cannot, Cannot emphasize enough, the guys at the depots are doing the most amazing job, but they're doing an amazing job in an incredibly unpredictable environment. So we looked at, well, in that case, what can we do about that? Now, because as I said, we started work with Rolls-Royce Power Systems, we've got some information about something that was on a train and Rolls-Royce was willing to share a little tiny bit of information from that, that thing. Obviously not everything, nobody's going to be interested in all of the telemetry off, off, their, off their component, but if they could just share one thing, and that one thing was the GPS feed, second thing actually, the mapping to the train. So we know this is a unit that's on this train and we know where that unit is, therefore we kind of know where the train is. The other piece that we could bring in, and this is when we started to work with, with Peter, was to look at what else do we know about the rail ecosystem? Well, we know where the services are because Network Rail has got data indicating what service, so where the services are so that you and I can catch the trains that we want to catch and know if they're running late. But what they don't necessarily know, again, unless it's manually updated, is which train is running that service. Is it Thomas the Tank Engine or is it Percy or is it James? They don't know necessarily, but we did because we knew which component was on which train. And by working with, with Peter, we can match the train movement to the train service, which means magically we know if it's staying on the path it was meant to go. So we know, if it, you, I'm sure you all know, trains are given diagrams for the day made up of head codes for the individual journeys. So a train sets out on its big day's plan for the day, its diagram. If it then deviates from that diagram partway through the day, we've been tracking it on, along its diagram, suddenly it's heading off in, in a different direction. We can therefore, working with Peter, understand, actually now it's on this diagram. It's not on that one anymore. That's really, really useful information because we know where that new diagram ends the day. And therefore we can start to share some really useful information. Your train is no longer doing what you thought it was doing and it's going to end the day here instead of there. So this was the, the information that we started to pull together to enable exactly as it says on the, on the screen. If somebody actually knows what's really gonna happen for tonight's shift, then they can start to make plans that are actually going to stick, maintenance plans that are, are going to be actually actuated by their engineers, which means that people have got far more ability to do really good value add tasks rather than scrabbling around with engineers doing, doing tasks they shouldn't necessarily be doing, working on plans when they should be actually hands on on the train. So really starting to um, enable that whole depot piece to work much more efficiently, getting the trains in in the right order. You know if a train's coming in early, so you can make sure it's not blocking the apron so that you can actually get the trains that should be in the sheds in the shed. On to the next slide. So we created a few pieces of visualization, not that IOTICS by any stretch is focused on visualization, where we're all about the data, but we just thought well, we need to create something so people can actually see things. So initially for the depot manager, he needed his depot view of what's coming into my depot. I don't care about anybody else's depot, what's happening at mine. We also looked at a train dashboard. And, and started to bring together for a particular train, given that we've created a digital twin of a train, albeit it's not a very clever twin at the moment, it just knows which power generating units attached to it and roughly about its schedule, doesn't know much else yet. 
Um, and then we've got our train deviation and tracking forecasting. So if we just take a look through those briefly, if you can move us on, Peter. Yeah, so the dashboard, single view, single pane. You can see that this particular depot is Stoke Gifford. Um, what we've brought in is the actual arriving, arrival times. We've identified, is it coming in as planned? Is it delayed? Is it reallocated? Should it have been going somewhere else? Therefore, do I need to be drawing up a plan in haste? Um, we've also got the prioritization um, for maintenance. So that was information coming from the train maintainer. They were able to share that information. So that makes the digital twin of the train just that tiny bit more intelligent. The other piece that we did right at the end, I don't know if you can see that, that very end column on that first panel, those of you back there. But we've also brought in pollen. Now, pollen certainly isn't owned by the train maintenance company. It's not owned by the component manufacturer. It's not owned by Network Rail. There's an EU service that tells you, for those of us who suffer from hay fever, what is the pollen count? Pollen actually does horrible things to train engines. It blocks the air filters, and it means you actually do need to get them in the shed to clean out the filter. So having that additional column, bringing in information from something completely different, which just gives that context to what the train's been experiencing that day, gives the maintenance engineers just that bit of extra intelligence about what they need to be doing. So we added that in, and of course you could just keep adding. You could start to bring in extreme weather events. You could bring in anything else. We could start to bring in more intelligence about the train if we start to enrich the, the a digital twin of the train with more information. We could add more restrictions such as nose cone damage or cab damage, which indicates whether or not the train can be, can or can't or can or must be hitched to another train. Because it's about this particular depot and because we've got information from elsewhere, we've also created little panels that they can add and add and subtract as they want about the local weather, the actual sensors that are around them at their depot so they can understand, okay, which, which sensors are we actually looking at here? Which pollen sensor is it? Which, which um, weather sensor is it? Is it actually the prevailing way, um, weather for today? So moving on, you'll see a very similar therefore picture around the train, but clearly this time everything is now just rejigged with the central focus being the train. So what particular prioritizations has this train got? And as I said, if we continue to enrich the digital twin of the train, so we can enrich this dashboard and start to bring in information from much wider systems that the guys are already using about um, the maintenance requirements of the train. If we move on then, Peter. And again, the little widget that just says, something's happened, the train has deviated. We just got that going as an email alert at the moment because you know the guys aren't necessarily sat at desks in front of screens. So just having a ping email come in, they know wherever they are that something's happened. We could just as easily in action of a text message or whatever it needs to be. Um, it's just an action based on a, a captured event. Next. So yes, what we'd like to do is just to start enriching this with more information. And hence we're out here talking to a wider community just to start to understand what else can be, can be brought in. The conditions-based um, maintenance certainly is, is becoming very prominent in other sectors. So let's see what we can do around rail if that would help. Um, and start also to understand what is the risk of not doing the maintenance today? You know, if you start to bring in enough information about the components and enough learning from their predictive maintenance capabilities, then it means that the, the depot managers can say, OK, right, you know, I can't get every train in the shed tonight, but and I prioritise these. I can't get these in. What does that mean? Does that mean I absolutely have to be getting them in tomorrow? Have I got a couple of days grace? Or actually, can I not let that, that train leave the depot tomorrow? Right. So yes, uh, yes, this is our, as I said, this is probably our, our overall roadmap for what we'd like to do next. You'll see there in the middle, we're moving towards planned. So if we know what today, 
today's diagram is. Therefore, if the trains are arriving today at this depot, what is the likely diagram for tomorrow? They do tend to follow a pattern. So if we can start to give more information, then once again, your depot manager can go, OK, right, I'm making this decision that actually this train can't come in the shed tonight. Where's it going to be tomorrow? Is it going to be on the siding outside of Hereford, in which case I need to do something today? Or actually, is it going to be at a different depot tomorrow and I can do something about it? Next. Again, train bash dashboard functionality, what else can we do? Can we start to bring in that what happens tomorrow? The same, same ideas, but really from the perspective of the train again. Next. The other challenge that they set us was the fleet planner. So a different role within, within the same company, um, but really the person who's liaising most with the train operating company to say, we need this distribution of the fleet across these different depots and these different overnight locations so that tomorrow's service can be met. And if tomorrow's service looks like that, then what about the day after that? Can we start to move further into the, into the future and understand quite what's going to happen? Can you move me on once you're back? Thank you kindly. So again, same three concepts really. Can we look at the depot fleet dashboard? So instead of looking at a single depot, looking at a, um, the entire fleet, what does the train fleet look like rather than view single view of train? And of course, you, the your fleet um, manager does still need his, his train fleet, his, his single train view. So if we move on to the next one. Yes, so here um, this dashboard is, is configured to have lots of different depots on it. So slightly tighter. We've lost all of the information about the local stuff. You don't care. We're looking across the entire depots. Where is the spread of my fleet? Where is everything based? what's prioritized where, what's happening where, this sort of more global view. And then you've got that understanding, not only of what's going on in terms of maintenance priorities, um, but what is likely to happen tomorrow based on the spread of the fleet. Though one of the first things we've noticed um, going through this, this engagement is that we've actually got people talking. So from our first visit to our second visit, People had moved seats. They suddenly said, oh, we never thought about it before. We're shouting across the room to one another when something happens. We've now moved desks, so we're sitting next to one another, so we all know much quicker that something's happened. It's just little things. And the, the, the fleet planners are now having more engaged conversations with the depot managers because they've got more of an understanding of the spread and therefore more of an understanding about the impact of whether something gets maintained or not based on where it is. So that's been the fascinating thing to us. While we think we're making information available more easily, we've actually sparked off more conversations. So if we move on to the next one. Yep, so the fleet, the train fleet view is focused on the trains. Where are, where are, my, where are my trains from, from the perspective of the entire fleet? And therefore that ability to start sorting the entire fleet based on maintenance priority or condition, which trains have experienced high pollen? Quite likely it's going to be the ones that have been running the same route because they've all experienced those, those areas of high pollen. So therefore, is the extra resource, anything that we can do around the certain depots that are likely to be getting the, the trains in um, that have, have experienced the most pollen? What we've learned from working, particularly with the pollen sensors, is that the pollen sensors pick up different kinds of pollen. So presumably you can envisage a day when somebody goes, oh no, don't worry, it's only the birch pollen that never has much of an impact oh no it's the oilseed rape quick get everybody in cleaning the filters that's far worse you know, maybe we can start to understand which pollen is worse as well as which weather type is worse etc so is the more that we can do around the data and then you'll see that um we've got links obviously so you can jump um into the individual train view, which I think is the next slide. Um, you could jump into the individual depot view if you suddenly wanted to, from helicopter, zoom, zoom back down to the what's going on at, at the ground level. Yeah, next slide, please. 
yeah, so again, the train dashboard in the single view, as we've seen before, as useful to the to the fleet manager as it is to the to the um, depot manager. Next slide, please. So we think we're seeing real benefits, and we think also that we're seeing some real good cost benefits. Um, obviously, the the um, train maintenance companies, the train operating companies, are penalised if trains fail, if trains are sent out um, not at optimum performance. There seems to be those occasions where a train is sent out when it has got some kind of restriction and that cost can just be carried and it can be carried day after day because it's, it's something that's really not that visible. So if we can surface not only that, it, that this is going on, but also how to do something about it, then that's just a way of keeping on top of the, of the situation and start levelling out those fines. So the penalty payments were a really useful way of us trying to understand what kind of cost benefits there would be. It's far harder to prove out the operational efficiency costs that you're making at the depot. But clearly those are there, because if you are making sure that people can do the job that they were expecting to do and do as much of it in the shift that they've got available, then that means that you've got a, um, a healthier fleet overall. So I mentioned digital twins. So the way that we are doing this is to create digital twins of the assets that are of use. So if we go back to the original, which was creating a digital twin of a, of, a, of a specific component on a train, that's made up of lots and lots of different data points. Those individual data points might be fascinating individually to somebody who cares about those, but actually the manufacturer of that component wanted the view of their asset. They wanted to understand their asset in the way that their customer saw their asset. There is a problem with this thing here. I can't have this systems-based view of the world where I'm having to go across multiple systems to find out what's wrong. I need the information brought to me so I can fix the problem quicker. The same for the, the train manufacturer and maintainer. They want the information about their train. That's their asset of interest. So therefore, it might involve bringing information in around components. It might involve bringing in information from, and I know lots of people around the room have mentioned understanding different things that are happening around the train. So can we, is there a way of starting to bring that together to create a richer picture through the digital twin of, of what is going on? And as I said, you can be as broader as granular as you like. So with the, with the component that was on the train, it was only sharing its mapping to the train and its location, nothing else. But maybe it would be more relevant at some stage to add in more information so that you have, as I say, got that rich picture of what's going on. We also had the, um, the digital twins of the, the depots so that you could have that conversation with the depot. What would it look like if we started actually to enrich the picture of what's going on at the depot? What resources are there? What equipment is available? Where is the equipment? Which way round does the train need to be facing so that when it goes into the shed, it's level with the equipment that it, that it needs to fix that issue? So can you start to bring in all of those additional pieces just to make things run more smoothly? As I say, we're already working with network rail data. Um, so we have our, our individual IOTIC space, that's our product, IOTIC space. So an individual IOTIC space that brings in network rail data, and that is selectively sharing with, this, with the rest of this ecosystem, the component manufacturer, the OEM, the train manufacturer, the depots, sharing selectively information to make this work. So it's not a great leap to say, well, in that case, what if we start to bring in intelligence about infrastructure. What about having a conversation between track and train, overhead line equipment and train, signals and train? Can we start to um, 
allow for other people within the ecosystem to learn from a train going past and the information it has. So we've spoken to um, um, equipment manufacturers who've said it would be brilliant to know the length of the train, the load of the train, the speed it was going, whether it was decelerating at the time, because that all has a massive impact on what it's just driven over. And I can start to learn from the, from the predictive implications of that. So that's the, the picture that we are fascinated in seeing if, if, if this can be grown. Slide. So this is our ecosystem map that we've started to, to create and we can start to, to see some um, interesting potential use cases. Rough ride comes up over and over again, over headline equipment damage over and over again. How to manage the power supply, particularly as the, as the whole rail system sounds like it might be moving to more and more electrification potentially. So can we start those conversations going with more, more pieces of, of the ecosystem that is, is our rail? Peter, do you want to pick up here? Sure, yeah. So the thing for me, which is really exciting about all of this isn't necessarily the applied use case, although that, I mean, it's always good to have an applied use case. The digital twin model, I've heard people talk about digital twins for a number of years, and they've been sort of like, well, okay, but what, what is it? It's sort of like Bitcoin, it's like blockchain, it's sort of, it's a technology, it's not something that can actually be something that exists in, in reality. What I really like about this is that we're collecting data from various parts of the industry, putting it on probably what's best defined as a sort of dynamic enterprise service bus. We're bringing it in and we're saying whoever owns that data can then decide who gets access to that data, which is a very powerful thing. Open data, for example, I think could benefit from this hugely uh, one of the problems the industry has is scaling up, getting data out to people. So there's a network rail open data platform, there's the RDG data platform, but there are a load of systems around the industry that don't, to talk to a central location, don't push information out. And many people will say, well, hey, security, we can't go sharing this with the entire world. And using a digital twin, this is one example of what we can do for a train operator, but if you think forward with the data we've got, with the permission of operators, we can say, well, hey, you can then share these data points with who you want to share them with. And it's under their control. It's not under some centralized control. It's not a one size fits all. It's a, somebody can come along and say, I want information about, say, Great Western's Class 801 fleet. And you can give them just that information and they can have access to nothing else. You could say, we want all of this information public but this company to have access to, I don't know, train loading information from this class of train, this company to have access to Wi-Fi data for that class of train. So going on from this application, I think there are a lot of really useful ways in which we can take the digital twin technology and what we've built already, um, take it further um, under, the, under the guise of, <laughs> Christos, do you want to open that bottle of wine? <laughs> <laughs> now you've got to finish it. <laughs> yes. On the work. Sorry, for, for people watching remotely, we had a small issue with trying to pour a corked bottle of wine into a glass, which I thought I would mention. Um, so, yeah, for, for open data, <laughs> for open data, particularly as the rail data marketplace and the rail data council is a thing and it's looking to get more data out there, this is a really tangible way to get people to contribute data, but securely. And the person who contributes the data is in control of. Um, who can get access to the data. So I, I think this is immensely powerful. Shall I hand back to you? Sure. Yeah, yeah I must just emphasize we're not storing data, we're leaving data where it is. Um, what, we're, what we're doing is really sort of acting as the glue and enabling data be, to be shared where it needs to be shared with the correct permissions. Um, so, allow, as I say, allowing that very granular access or that much broader access as, as required. So that's us, open to questions. 
Yeah, I use the autumn line at Beyond Farm. It's quite a rough ride, but I think it's variable depending upon which unit and which coaches sit in. You're, yes, that, that is a very interesting point, and that's certainly one we've heard. So if, 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 I'm not sure if everybody heard who's on, online, we're talking about rough ride and the potential for a difference depending on which, which rolling, <coughs> rolling stock is being used. And that there's so a, it's the individual unit of rolling stock type. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yes, yes. And that, and because it might be something actually that's the unit and not not the track. Yeah, that's what I think a lot yeah. Of time. yeah. And so you can envisage a situation where you could actually, and that this starts to stretch your brain a bit. What if we had a digital twin of of the bump? So uh, something happened. Rough ride happens. You create a digital twin of that. So it, it's got a GPS location. If anything else picks that up, then there's an indication that maybe there is something genuinely there. If nothing else picks it up, then maybe it is that particular unit that actually has an issue and, and, and not that particular piece of track. But I know there are lots and lots of other technologies that are coming in that, that are trying to address that. Um, but what we're hoping to do is that we can start to leverage the exciting technologies that are being brought in. There, are, there is a, a competition that was run by Network Rail, I think about, probably about 20 months ago, pre-pandemic, um, that was looking at Rough Ride. And I think they down selected six different technologies to look at. So uh, do, do individual carriages have accelerometers on them? Because that would pick up Rough, rough Ride. Potentially you can. Um, I mean, you can even use um, a, a mobile phone. Um, within each carriage to detect certain things, but I think it needs. To, there's the, I'm not a technical person, but I think the need, the positioning of it is absolutely key. It needs to be low enough so that it's not, you know, a person. I mean, oh there's God, even I'm one. Fell over and bashed his head off one. Yeah. And the result was they then closed the line and fixed parts of the problem. And they know there are other parts of the problem with the line, but I'm sure. Right. Some yeah. units are more a problem than others yeah absolutely yeah yeah and and um a bird strike can cause a sufficient bump to make you think that it's a rough ride experience yeah um we have a question online from hayden who presumably is now dressed oh, <laughs> 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 um, i'm glad you're dressed hayden you have to be there by the way people online are thinking you're repeating questions um, they said there sorry hayden said there are a number of other digital twins across the capital sector and others how interoperable is yours with others? Um, IOTIC solution, Hayden, is something that connects data from anything with data from any other thing. So we love the idea that other people have created digital twins because that means there's a source of data. Um, so we're almost like the glue that can connect existing digital twins. There's a, there's a program, I don't know if you've heard of it, um, called National Digital Twin that's being led by Centre for Digitally Built Britain. Um, they've written a paper called The Gemini Principles plus others, but the Gemini Principles are quite an interesting starting point on, on um, how to, do, to describe and define a digital twin. Um, and their idea as well is that a national, there isn't going to be one ring that rules them all. There isn't going to be one digital twin for the entire UK. It's going to be lots and lots of, of federated twins that are talking to one another. And that's what we can enable. So brilliant that there are other digital twins out there. We focus on the data side of things. We are not visualization experts. So you can probably tell from the dashboards, they're not the most attractive thing in the, things in the world. Um, people could do much better, but, and we would love that. Um, I should say that we, just as we are creating virtualized data sources within our solution, in order for IOTIC space to work, you also have to create the virtualized consumer of data. So if you want to put any kind of visualization solution into this mix, you can do because you're simply creating a virtualized version. So it's like second life for things. It, it has to have this virtualized version to have that communication. So you, we can work with other digital twins. We can work with other sources of AI, other sources of visualization, whatever is needed. 
Does that answer your question, Hayden? He's got his Thanks. hands up and he turned his camera way up close. <laughs> <laughs> I can verify that. <laughs> yes. Um, so one recurring theme from these meetings has been that even if you have a great product as a new entrant or as a small company, it can be very difficult to navigate the procurement landscape of the industry. Yeah. What's your experience been in that regard? So question around our experience around procurement and being a small business um, in this, this complex rail ecosystem. Yes, it is very difficult. Um, we were very lucky in that we, we, it's almost like we didn't expect to start this journey. Originally, we were procured to do something very specific. It just so happened that the first component we, we worked on went to power a train. Similar components also power boats and all sorts of other things. So it, I might have been having this conversation with a maritime group um, if things had gone differently. Um, but given um, that Rolls-Royce engaged us to do the power generating unit and therefore all of a sudden was really excited about having this, not only it's, it's a wonderful physical entity that was its, its component, but now a digital version of it. What could it do with the digital? It was like having this additional toy to play with. So what could it do? And so they were the ones who broke the conversations with the manufacturer. We, we were talking to Network Rail, but of course, if you've got Rolls-Royce standing beside you in a room, then that's very helpful. So we have had conversations with Network Rail, um, the, the train operating company um, for the particular lines we were working on was amazing and has been absolutely brilliant about helping to unlock sources of data for us. Um, but it's really hard and it's really hard even convincing other train operating companies that we've done something useful. I think the, the challenge that I see as somebody new coming into rail is that everybody seems to be very, very heads down working on their own little bit of the universe. And they've got some amazing stuff to work with, work to make their bit of it work. Where the problems tend to happen is at the edges. So where their world actually spills over into somebody else's. And that's where I think we can really start to make a difference. But when you walk onto a new training operating company who's never experienced, no experience of you before, you know, their systems work. Why would they need this? It's just, so it's trying to have those conversations about, yes, but, you know, are those instances when, you know, what happens on the edge? Is there a, actually, is there some information out there that you keep thinking, gosh, if only, if only I had that. Um, so that's where we start. But yeah, it's, it's hard. We've been doing this yep, since 2018 and we've got this far and we would like to get a lot further. I also find there's uh, in the railway industry, in the software industry, there's an old phrase that everyone quotes, which is no one got fired for buying IBM or no one got fired yeah. for buying Microsoft. Yeah. The same thing exists in the railway in that if I'm a depot manager and I do my job to the specification that was originally given to me in my job description, I might even get a bonus. If I put my head above the parapet, suggest there might be a new way of doing things and it doesn't go perfectly, I'll be lynched. So the massive incentive is don't rock the boat, don't do anything different, don't do anything new, just do what you're told and no one will care. Yes, yes, I can, I can appreciate that. You know, it's often, you know, care for what you measure, isn't it? You know, that some, some metrics potentially are wrong, um, but big people, people are being measured on that. That's why you get patients left in hospital corridors. Hi, um, thank you for that, that's great. I had a question about the time scale. So is it, are you looking at now? Are you looking at the last day? Are you looking at the last month? What, what, when you look at your assets, um, what's what, What's the time frame that you're looking at within? So for time frame, we at IOTICS love real-time data. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, it's as real-time as the internet allows. So there's always some kind of a lag, but the, the sooner the better. We're interested in the dynamic stuff. Um, obviously, 
when we were creating the digital twin of the of the component clearly you need information that's locked away in databases that maybe doesn't change that often or if it's a technical document and you're linking to that because that's needed it's probably not going to change at all but the exciting stuff is where it's moving so that's why we that's one of the reasons we don't store data um, we're capturing metadata so we're describing a source of data but we're not capturing the data itself if somebody needs to capture the data we recommend that they do that elsewhere so the digital twin will bring information together it'll allow dynamic data to go where it needs to go that might be somebody collecting it then in a time series database so that they can understand it was this reading it was this reading it's this reading for us it's far more exciting to say not to say that it was 222, but to say, oh, it's 15, rather than it was 222. So yeah, capture those. Right now, yeah. With the data that we've got. Yes, yes. And, and particularly surfacing those significant events. So surfacing when something interesting happens or when the data is interacting, you know. So we've done some work in the construction industry and it's, or oh, actually just going back to that pollen use case, it was interesting that the train went through high pollen and the engine was operating. If the engine wasn't operating at the, at the time, you haven't got a problem. So actually it's knowing those two pieces of information, one from the EU pollen sensors and the other from the component manufacturer, and neither one of them care and are not going to do anything with that interaction. It's somebody completely different. It's your depot manager from your manufacturer who needs to know that those two things were happening at once. So that's why we're excited about dynamic data. Okay. Oh, hello. Sorry, Ron, sorry. Um, John Chris Jones, I work at the Department of Transport and I lead the government's approach to vaccine passports, but one of the better phrases. And that's sort of related to this question. But going back to your discussion around significant incidents and things like that, how quickly can you kill the transmission of data? So, say data might be needed for criminal proceedings or something, so major happens, but you've got agreements that people can access this data. Can I update that as a data owner quickly? Can you pull it quickly? How does that work? So we have this concept of the, the twin having sort of self-sovereignty. So the digital twin decides with whom it shares when. Um, now, clearly something happens. How quickly can something be, be cartoned and not shared anymore? Um, from my optics standpoint, we are allowing data to be shared based on certain principles and protocols that have been set up. So somebody cleverer with AI, if they're able to set up that context of actually in this situation, stop sharing everything, then absolutely that, that's what you can do. But um, that's, not some, that's not something that we have done with our own technology yet possibly we might do in the future but again because we're not ai experts we're brilliant at what we're brilliant at doing it which is sharing data um we'd much rather somebody else came up with that capability and simply applied it yeah 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 hello hello um do you i don't know where it is um do you help people understand what the data is to use or is it just that it's a sharing the data of the two parties or whatever? <coughs> For example, if I came to you and for some of my data, how would I know that was compatible or even relevant to the data I'm currently using? Right. So, a question around um, how do you understand if the what re effectively what the data is and whether it's going to be relevant to you? That, yeah, so, um, we follow the FAIR scientific data principles. The FAIR scientific data principles stands for something. It's making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So if we start with findable, the way that we're doing making things findable is by modeling things around digital twins and describing sources semantically. So if you're after a particular data source, so supposing you were after temperature, 
you'd want to know that something is publishing temperature. Is it calling it temperature? Is it calling it T? Is it calling it temp? It might be so. So centigrade. yeah, yes. Is it exactly? Is it centigrade? Is it Fahrenheit? How so? How is it? So by using semantics to describe the data source, that makes it far more easy when somebody like you comes along and says, "I need temperature in Celsius." then the, the solution can respond and say, here's a digital twin that's got temperature in Celsius. Is this what you're wanting? Pressure is a really interesting one. Is it pressure from underneath the driver's seat? Is it the oil pressure? What kind of pressure? So you really need a lot of context in order to understand data. Um, so that's what we're trying to do with that first bit of findable. And then by modeling things in an understandable way, so modeling things around assets of interest and and as i say allowing things to share appropriately then making it accessible interoperable i mean somebody said to me once oh it's a bit like your babel fish you know because we're sort of creating this normalized world where data is just there it's it it is accessible because it's it's um defined by the metadata so you understand what it is you're getting do you verify it any sort of way, or is it just what we're saying? We didn't start by doing a verification process, but what's been fascinating is by growing out the ecosystem, suddenly you are verifying data. Because um, I mentioned about the mapping, so the mapping of the components, the train. That's because, again, you're dependent on somebody manually updating if actually they've taken that unit off that train because they were working on it and there's now a different one so actually we could notice if there were two units moving off down the track attached to the train that we thought they should be attached to and one was still over there then we could then go back to the component manufacturer and say think your system might need updating at this point so all of a sudden you're using some other contextual data, which was still their own data to, um, to, to validate and verify. What then gets exciting is that if you've got another source of data that you know is from that train, the Wi-Fi signal, another component, then you've got yet another backup to say, actually, it really, really does look like two of your units are somewhere else and that one is still attached to the train. So you've got that ability to start. So it gets really exciting. If you start to layer on more and more data, then you can start to do that verification validation. Um, and it really starts to hold a mirror back up to the to those who are owning the digital twins to go, oh, oh, actually, yes, there was we've had a conversation with with somebody who does provide some of the solutions that are already doing this amazing job of trying to work out where the trains are. And they said, you know, for the most part, we know exactly where the trains are. It's just in those moments of complete madness when all hell's broken loose and people don't have time to update the system, in which case it would be brilliant if some if your if your digital twin could just go hello we don't think that's right anymore and just highlight not change anything but just point and highlight and and do that verification and validation yeah. you uh, you mentioned a lot about your gps data yes how do you handle the situation where there are multiple tracks in the same direction close together and the gps error is not good enough to tell which one I might have to hand over to Peter for that one. Um, it's difficult. Um, it's a case of assuming that several trains run, or two trains will not run at the same speed throughout their entire journey. So at the start of the journey, you may know that, or you may have a good idea that this unit is going to um, leave Paddington on this service. Two may leave at the same time, but they will have different calling patterns. So you can look at the diagram data, the historical data you've got, and we do that, and then say, right, well, this could be one or two trains, but then at some point, one train will be going faster than the other, will stop at Slough, will not stop at Slough, for example. And then you can work it out from that. So um, we can't always be 100% accurate the moment the train leaves, but if we're not sure, we won't say this train's deviated until we actually know the train's deviated. Yeah, I mean, on a mobile phone, you just get GPS and it's not very accurate. 
offshore oil where I used to work used differential GPS. So you're getting a land base that's not moving, sending correction data by radio, but it's correcting and giving all the errors and that comes from GPS down from maybe 10 meters to about a meter. And it would that would be able to take the difference in which track the train's on. But we, we don't really care about exactly which track the train's on. We just care the train is between here and here and it's running according to this timetable. But for rough riders to do. Yeah. yeah, if yeah. we start to move into other use cases, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 So rough ride we're com we're coming to. Um to be honest, what once we're once we're actually up against a problem, we'll look at what other data sources we can use. For example, train describer data, which can say this train is running the service. That train on a train describer is running is that service that is on the up fast line or the up slow line. And then we can use that to say, right, you've got this GPS position that's you know you know it's going at a certain speed down the track but it's sort of jumping from side to side we can say with the td data another data source says it's on this track so we'll snap it to that track so we can then say right okay this position down the track and this line is where the rough ride event occurred my example happens to be a single line Right. Um, I'm just wondering if the majority, I don't know if you can answer this, the majority of your customers use the data in a retrospective manner, or if you have people involved in historic data in so terms for example, if you're looking at future plans. So whether people are using dynamic data or whether they are wanting to, to look at things historically, um, both both of those is true. Um, so as I said, we 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 have an, an issue with persistence of data within IOTIC space because how much do you store? So it's a constant debate and we really are trying to avoid it if we possibly can. We'd much rather, if there was a use case that demanded, and there always will be, of course you need to analyze over time, that that data is then, the digital twin can just root that data so that it can be stored somewhere so that you can do that analysis over time. So there are plenty of solutions far better that can do that. So use those solutions. We, we can just enable the, so the, the R bit of the fair data principles reusable. Let's allow multiple use cases to be fed by that, those same sources of data rather than duplicating. So if one of those uses happens to be analysis over time, then fine, let's root that data so that that can happen. Yeah, so there are instances of that. Um, I can't think of anything that we've done in rail around that. We've done it in construction, where they had to really have a record of what was going on on the site. So, you know, there was high winds, the cranes couldn't operate, therefore we sent people off to do this instead. They needed the record as to why a decision was made. And so it was, it was the capturing of this was happening and this was happening and therefore we did this. Yeah. So, sort of like my question, but say I was to then set up something that would record data that you do provide. Who owns that data and who's responsible for it? That do you put in terms of usage? People use your service that you can only keep X amount, or you can only do X different store promos. Or... So that's where it gets really exciting. And so far, we've worked with organisations within a sort of set collaboration. So because a digital twin is sharing with an, maybe another body, an external partner. So in, in the ecosystem that we've talked about here, we've got multiple partners sharing data. So far, no money is, share, is changing hands between them because they're all getting value as the fact that they're sharing data with one another. But you can certainly see a, a state where actually somebody just wants to consume. They don't necessarily want to put back, in which case maybe there would be some kind of contract, in which case maybe there would be uh, a reason for having that kind of um, uh, contract or whatever in place that, that explained why somebody could store that data. But... As I said, that's where it gets really exciting because, in effect, you are then creating a data marketplace. You know, we, we hear so often about data being gold or oil or whatever it's meant to be. How, how valuable is it? 
nobody knows because until you start sharing it and using it, you don't know how valuable it is. So until you enable these use cases and allow people to have access to data that they wouldn't otherwise have had access to, you're never going to know. And I think I think that's what we'd like to see in the next two years. I wasn't. That's actually really interesting. I was thinking about for a month or two, and I was looking at it from a legal point of view. So, say I was to store data that you provide and then use it at a later date as something that may upset someone. Who owns that data? Do I have the right to do that? Do you have any governance to use of data in that manner, or is it? So, the data is. is we're not storing data. The data is retained by the, the owner of the data. So we're leaving data where it, where it is effectively, leaving it at rest. We're, we are sharing it on an agreed basis. So the digital twin having the self-sovereignty is deciding with whom and where it shares data. If one of those sharing endpoints happens to be something that is going to store, then that is what needs the conversation and that is what is going to need some kind of legal contract to that very point. And as I say, we've not really had to stray into that as yet because we've been working within consortiums within rail and within construction where it has been nice and neat and tight and everybody's engaged. So we've we've yet to experience that. But yeah, that would be for legal bodies. You, you found it sounds like that collaboration and sharing of all this data is going to be And um, the brand industry appears to be moving in a direction that acknowledges that actually having lots of parties who are like acrimoniously arguing about stuff is bad. And actually, it's much better to have lots of parties collaborating and working together. So, in that, in that context, do you think the future? actually has all of this kind of rolling stock state data just available for the whole industry to, to use and is, is that is that desirable or, or, or practical so is it desirable to have rolling stock data freely available i think that the, you, there's always going to be some control needed over that and that's why we make sure that we do have those security protocols in place where the twin can decide with whom it, it shares and when it shares because you know to the to the question earlier we, we can't we don't necessarily know what bad use somebody might put the data to but you've got to pre-plan and think okay well that could happen so yes it, it, i think it would be a far better situation if data was more freely available but you're always going to have to do that in a, in a controlled way. Um, so going back to the, the component manufacturer, what would be the point of them sharing everything with everybody? Some of it's proprietary, it might be, it might be releasing IP that they don't want to share. So you're not going to release everything, but there are certain pieces. So I wouldn't advocate that people just openly share everything. You know, if you speak to the guys at the ODI, they're, when they're not advocating open data as in open the doors, everybody knows everything about everybody, but it is that appropriate sharing. And I think appropriate sharing within the context of a rail industry absolutely can potentially move from the blame situation, which, which is, you know, it is prevalent. It really is. Penalty payments, unfortunately, do create that blame culture into something that, that I think could be much more positive and ultimately benefit the passenger. As you, 